Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations hearing will now come to order. Today, the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations is holding a hearing entitled A Public Health Emergency State Efforts to Curb the Opioid Crisis. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine states' efforts and successes in addressing the opioid epidemic, as well as opportunities for future federal support. And just to let everybody know, Dr. Alexander Scott, the uh, reason why we're getting started a little late, uh, the plane was delayed, but now um, doc the doctor's on her way. And um, so we will uh, swear in the witnesses when we get to that point, and if we have to do that one later, we will. The chair will now recognize herself for an opening statement. As I said, today the com committee continues its bipartisan efforts to combat the opioid crisis. As we know, the country's in the midst of an epidemic unlike any in recent history. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, from 1999 to 2017, nearly 400,000 people died from opioid overdoses. In 2017, more than two-thirds of drug overdose deaths involved opioids. The crisis has continued to evolve, and the challenges that we face have continued to evolve along with it. The first wave of this crisis began in the 1990s with the overprescribing of pain medications. The second wave began in 2010 with increased deaths due to heroin overdoses. Like the first two waves, the third wave, marked by the rise of synthetic opioids like fentanyl, have shattered lives, traumatized families, and devastated communities. Now, unfortunately, it looks like a fourth wave of the crisis may have already arrived. The opioid epidemic has fueled a huge increase in methamphetamine use. In 2018, there were more than twice as many deaths involving meth as 2015, and meth is increasingly turning up in overdose deaths and drug busts across the country. Given the complexity of the epidemic and its ability to evolve, states, federal government agencies, and Congress must remain vigilant. To that end, this committee has taken numerous steps to investigate the origins and drivers of the crisis so we can learn from it as we try to get ahead of the next wave. Through committee hearings, we have heard from states, federal agencies, and drug distributors about their roles and responses. The groundbreaking work by the committee un uncovered some of the failures that led to where we are today. And looking forward, we're focused on identifying ways to stem this crisis and bring relief to the millions of Americans who are suffering. As part of that effort, our committee has worked across the aisle to pass bipartisan legislation designed to give states the tools and resources needed to help those impacted by substance use disorder. These legislative packages provided states billions of dollars in federal funding to assist in opioid response, treatment, and recovery efforts. And we've made some progress. CDC provisional data indicates that drug overdose, death, overdose deaths have fallen for the first time in decades. While this downward shift is welcome news, the crisis is far from over, and we must continue to look for ways to bring relief to struggling cities and towns throughout the country. Today's hearing continues those bipartisan efforts. Day in and day out, states are on the front lines of this epidemic that kills more than 130 Americans every day. As the epidemic now enters a new decade, states face the challenge of keeping pace with an evolving crisis. In keeping with this committee's bipartisan commitment to finding solutions for this national emergency, last September the committee sent letters to 16 states requesting information about on-the-ground efforts to cur curb the epidemic. The committee has sought to understand whether federal funds actually reach the hardest-hit communities, how states use the funds provided by Congress, and what strategies have proven to be successful. Today, we have five key states that have each received a letter from this committee. These states represent the first line of defense against the crisis, and they each play pivotal roles in treatment, recovery, and prevention efforts. I want to thank all of you for coming today. The states compose a large swath of the country. While their demographics, ge geography, and challenges vary, each has felt the effect of this epidemic, and they all rank among the states with some of the highest overdose death rates. As such, each of them have taken a number of steps to curb the epidemic. 
For example, Pennsylvania was able to distribute nearly 13,000 naloxone kits free of charge in 2018 and again in 2019 thanks to a combination of state and federal funding. North Carolina provided treatment to 12,000 uninsured persons thanks again to federal funding. And Rhode Island has been able to expand medication-assisted treatment in the prison system, resulting in a 62% reduction in overdose deaths. These are just a few examples of how the states are fighting this epidemic and helping communities. As Congress considers future action to address this crisis, all of our witnesses today provide important insights on how federal funds are being used to combat the epidemic, what efforts are proving successful, and what we need to do for further improvement. I thank the witnesses for their service, for being here to testify on behalf of their states, and I look forward to hearing how we can all continue to work together to find the desperately needed solutions. And with that, I'm pleased to yield for purposes of an opening statement, Mr. Guthrie, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair DeGette, for holding this important hearing on state responses to the opioid crisis. Our local communities are su suffering. On average, 130 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose, and opioids were involved in 47,600 overdose deaths in 2017, which accounted for 67.8% of all drug overdose deaths. In Kentucky, there were 1,160 reported opioid-involved deaths in 2017. The Energy and Commerce Committee has been steadfast in its efforts to help combat the opioid epidemic with both investigations and legislation. Whether it was the committee's investigations into the prescription drug and heroin epidemic, opioid distributors, patient brokering, or the major opioid manufacturers, we have continued to ask questions and get answers for the American public. When it comes to legislation, this committee led the way on the passage of the 21st Century Cures Act, the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act, the Support for Patients and Communities Act. I was proud to work on all three of these uh, comprehensive laws, which are designed to combat the opioid crisis through prevention, advancing treatment and recovering initiatives, protecting communities, and bolstering our efforts to fight synthetic drugs like fentanyl. This hearing is a critical opportunity for us to check in with the states, those that are on the front lines battling the nation's opioid epidemic, to see how the federal money Congress provided is being allocated and spent what successes they are having in combating the epidemic, but also what challenges they are still facing and what additional authorities and resources could be helpful. The good news is that each state testifying before us today has seen a decrease in their overdose death rates. Federal assistance is making a difference. In addition, states are creating and implementing innovative approaches to combating the epidemic. Examples include expanding efforts to connect people to treatment through EMS in emergency departments, expanding and increasing the availability of naloxone and medication-assisted treatment, increasing non-emergency transportation options to treatment for those in rural areas, expanding neonatal abstinence syndrome treatment programs for pregnant and parenting mothers, and efforts to address workforce issues through the initiatives such as a loan repayment program and broadening the curriculum and training in medical schools. This hearing is a great platform for the states to share how the federal funding has made a difference in what programs they are wor and working. Not only is it helpful for us in Congress as we continue to conduct oversight le and legislate, but also to the states as they learn from each other about new ideas or innovative approaches that can be implemented. While progress is being made and some of the overdose deaths rates are declining, the Director of National Institute of Drug Abuse, Dr. Nora Volkow, declared this week that this country still has not controlled its addiction problems. Some states are continuing to see a high number of first responder emergency department encounters due to an overdose. In addition, states are still facing many challenges, including a lack of qualified workforce and infrastructure, varying requirements and timelines and different, fun different federal funding streams, and restrictions on funding including that some funds have been restricted to opioids, impeding flexibility to address emerging challenges. In addition to the continuing threat of opioids, states are starting to see more instances of polysubstance abuse and polysubstance overdose deaths, with states specifically citing stimulants such as methamphetamine and cocaine as a growing concern. Nationally, since last year, methamphetamine has been detected in more deaths than opioids, such as oxycodone and hydrocodone. In 14 of the 35 states 
that report overdose deaths to the federal government on a monthly basis, methamphetamine is involved in more deaths than fentanyl. The threats are evolving and the fight is not over. We want to continue partnering with state and local entities to combat the opioid epidemic as well as emerging threats, which is why it's important to not let our foot off the gas. Congress needs to continue supporting the states and this committee needs to continue conducting oversight of these critical issues. I wanna thank all the witnesses for being here today. I look forward to hearing from you about all your successes we have had in combating our nation's opioid epidemic, but also how the threat has changed, what challenges remain, and what more we in Congress can do with our partners, you, in this fight. And I yield back. Thank the gentleman. She turn out recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Chairwoman DeGette. Today's hearing continues the committee's ongoing bipartisan efforts to combat the opioid epidemic. Whether fueled by prescription drugs or illicit synthetic opioids, this epidemic is a constantly evolving threat, putting people, families, and communities at grave risk. This is not a crisis that we can solve overnight, and it requires ongoing federal and state attention. And states are on the front lines of this national emergency, providing much of the support for those in need there are eyes and ears on what's occurring on the ground, and that's why this hearing is so important. It's the latest in a series of hearings we've held on the opioid crisis. In the past, we've heard from several states, including Rhode Island, about on-the-ground efforts to curb the epidemic. Last year, we also heard from federal agencies about the urgent threat posed by fentanyl. The committee also conducted a two-year bipartisan investigation into opioid distribution practices. The Energy and Commerce Committee has also been at the forefront of passing critical legislation that gives our federal, state, and local partners the tools and resources required to succeed in this fight, including three pieces of legislation, all bipartisan, that were designed to give states funding and support. In 2016, the committee passed and President Obama signed into law the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, CARA, and the 21st Century Cures Act. Of course, I have to mention that Chairwoman that gets a major role uh, in that. These two laws authorized over a billion dollars in state-specific grants and helped states bolster evidence-based treatment, prevention, and recovery efforts. In 2018, the Support Act was passed and signed into law, reauthorizing opioid-specific funding, increasing opioid abuse and overdose prevention training, and improving coordination and quality of care. And then in December, the House passed H.R. 3, the Lower Drug Costs Now Act, which included $10 billion in additional opioid funding. This committee is committed to making sure communities are receiving the support they need to get relief from this crisis, and that's why we sent letters to 16 states last year requesting information on how federal funds have assisted states in this fight and what additional help Congress can provide as we consider future action. We wanted to know how states are using federal opioid funds, what's being done to ensure those funds reach the hardest hit regions, and how funds have helped transform state treatment systems. Based on the responses, we heard that the federal money has allowed states to take important and innovative approaches to addressing opioid addiction. One of the most effective tools that is available to the states is Medicaid. Several states elaborated on the important role of Medicaid in stemming this crisis and their responses to the committee. A study released last week found that about 8,000 lives have been saved from an opioid overdose thanks to the expansion of Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. We also want to hear about any emerging trends in substance abuse that they're seeing. For example, several states informed the committee that while they continue to fight the opioid epidemic, they are also seeing an increase in methamphetamine and polysubstance use. <laughs> and this, of course, is an alarming trend that threatens to become the next epidemic, and I want to hear how Congress can help states confront this unfolding danger. So again, thank the witnesses. Look forward to hearing about their efforts. Thank you, Madam Chair, for continuing uh, your efforts on this. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants my time. If not, I'm going to yield back. Thank you. Thank, thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Walden, for five minutes. For Morning, Madam Chair, and thanks for holding this critically important hearing. As I was uh, preparing for this, I noticed in my biggest county in my district, uh, they have a yellow alert up uh, for opioids. Um, they had two overdoses on average per week in Jackson County, Oregon. They had seven last week, fortunately uh, no deaths. The first responders administered naloxone in Jackson County five times last week. They believe that it's probably heroin with a pretty heavy dose of fentanyl in it. So um, the deadly scourge continues. 
Uh, for many years, as you've heard, the Energy and Commerce Committee, and this subcommittee in particular, has been at the forefront of congressional efforts to address the opioid uh, crisis and substance use uh, disorder issues. Uh, and, and we've done a lot of work on prevention. Uh, we know we have a lot more work to do. This committee's held hearings and conducted investigations on opioids and the opioid epidemic for nearly two decades, from bringing in Purdue Pharma to testify in 2001 about the abuse of OxyContin to uh, our bipartisan investigations last Congress into the rise of fentanyl, opioid manufacturing, opioid distribution, and the substance use disorder treatment industry. These early hearings helped inform our legislative work, including the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act, or CARA, the 21st Century Cures Act, which authorized the state-targeted response to the opioid crisis grants, and billions more in federal appropriations to boost programs that fight, treat, and stop substance abuse and support access to mental health services. These efforts uh, culminated in the signing into law of the Support Act in the last Congress. In my home state of Oregon, we've seen the results, a 3.1 percent reduction in opioid deaths based on the most recent statistics from the CDC. I'm pleased we have continued to work together in this space. It's important, including by continuing our work on fentanyl and with this important hearing today examining how the states are utilizing the funding and the authorities provided by Congress. But there's so much more we could do together. Earlier this year, Energy and Commerce uh, Republicans published a request for information about the substance use disorder treatment industry. The RFI built off the patient brokering investigation that we conducted in the last Congress, and this investigation brought us to the question of what is good treatment, and conversely, what is bad treatment, which is the central question posed by our RFI. With the billions of dollars we're sending into the states for prevention and treatment, we need answers. Just yesterday, Energy and Commerce Republicans sent a letter to the three opioid manufacturers we began investigating together last Congress, asking them to complete production to our requests. It's critical we fully understand the causes of the opioid epidemic in order to ensure that our solutions are the right ones, and it's important that they answer our questions. We should also hold a comprehensive series of hearings to conduct oversight of the implementation of the Support Act. For example, relevant to today's hearing, the Support Act included the Info Act, sponsored by Mr. Latta, which calls for the creation of a public and easily acceptable electronic dashboard linking to all the nationwide efforts and strategies to combat the opioid crisis. The Info Act was designed to meet a specific need of local stakeholders who were telling us that despite Congress having devoted record numbers of federal dollars to combat the opioid crisis, they had trouble finding what resources were available and where they were. This is certainly an issue we heard a lot about from Mr. McKinley and others. This provision is absolutely critical in helping those on the front lines of the opioid crisis, but I'm really concerned about its slow implementation. In addition to oversight of the Support Act, we also need to begin working on the next wave of legislation to address not only opioid crisis, but also substance use disorders more broadly. Most urgently, we need to reauthorize the fentanyl ban, which is set to expire in a matter of weeks. Reauthorizing the prohibitions on various forms of fentanyl as broad bipartisan support, we should do that expeditiously. And today's hearing is an important step, though, to understand the impact that federal grant dollars are having on states. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here and being part of this equation, and I look forward to hearing from you. With that, I'd yield the balance of my time to the ranking member on the subcommittee on health, Mr. Burgess. Uh, thank the gentleman for yielding, and of course, it was under your leadership of the full committee that last year we worked in a bipartisan manner to produce legislation that ultimately was signed into law by President Trump in October of, of 2018. And it really began in this subcommittee with a member day that we did, and we heard from over 50 members of not just the committee, but throughout the Congress, the problems they had in their districts and the ideas that they were bringing to the table that we could, we could work on. The Support Act was written to help advance treatment and recovery initi initiatives for those affected by opiate habituation. I too want to thank our witnesses for being here today. You'll be helpful in understanding the challenges that we face continuing this fight against opiate addiction and death while ensuring that patients can manage their pain. It is important to Congress to have hearings like this where we can ensure the effectiveness of legislative efforts and identify gaps of where they exist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. And Madam Chair, I'd yield back with the notation that some of us have the other subcommittee upstairs, so we'll be coming and going between hearings. So thank you, and I yield thank back. You. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent that the members' written opening statements be made part of the record without objection so ordered. 
I now want to introduce the witnesses for today's hearings. Ms. Jennifer Smith, who's the Secretary of the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, welcome. Dr. Monica Burrell. Uh, Dr. Burrell is the Commissioner, Depart Department of Public Health, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott, I think they beamed you here from the airport, so congratulations. She's the Director of the Department of Health of the State of Rhode Island. Ms. Christina Mullins, Commissioner, Bureau for Behavioral Health, Department of Health and Human Services, State of West Virginia, welcome. And Mr. Cody Kinsley, Deputy Secretary, Behavioral Health and Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, Department of Health and Human Sur Services, State of North Carolina, welcome to you. Thanks all of you for appearing in front of the subcommittee today. As you are aware, the committee's holding an investigative hearing. And when we do so, we have the practice of taking all of our testimony under oath. Do any of you have objection to take testifying under oath today? Let the record reflect the witnesses responded no. The chair then advises you under the rules of the House and the rules of the committee, you're entitled to be accompanied by counsel. Does any of you wish to be accompanied by counsel? Let the record reflect the witnesses have responded no. So if you would, would you please rise and raise your right hand that you may be sworn in. Do you swear the testimony you give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You may be seated. Let the record reflect the witnesses responded affirmatively, and all of you are now under oath and subject to the penalty set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the U.S. Code. The chair now recognizes our witnesses for five-minute summaries of their written statements. In front of each of you, there's a microphone, a timer, and a series of lights. The timer counts down your time, and the red light turns on at the end when your five minutes have come to an end. Um, and so now, uh, Ms. Smith, I'm pleased to recognize you for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman, ranking member, and members of the subcommittee, my name is Jennifer Smith, and I am secretary for Pennsylvania's Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs as well as a member of the National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors. Thanks for your interest in how Pennsylvania is using the state opioid response funding to promote prevention, treatment, and recovery efforts. Acting as the state's single authority for substance use disorder services, my department coordinates efforts with federal and local entities, as well as across state departments. Our ability to orchestrate resources and direct policy during the opioid crisis has been a crucial component in effecting long-term change and maximizing resources available to our communities. We are grateful for these federal grant opportunities at a time of hopelessness and despair for families and communities. I can say with certainty that this funding has saved lives. With a population of 12.8 million, Pennsylvania is the fifth most populous state consisting of 67 counties that range from large urban centers to rural counties. Our state is among those hardest hit by the nation's prescription opioid and heroin epidemic. In 2014, we lost more than 2,700 Pennsylvanians to drug-related overdoses, which equates to seven deaths per day. By 2017, that number had tragically doubled to more than 5,400 lives lost, or 13 deaths per day. As statistics rose year over year, our primary focus became simple, keep Pennsylvanians alive. That meant infusing naloxone into communities, implementing warm handoff protocols to transition overdose survivors from emergency departments into treatment, expand access to evidence-based practices such as medication-assisted treatment, and launching a 24-7 Get Help Now hotline. I'm proud to say that in 2018, Pennsylvania reported an 18% decrease in overdose deaths. While it's not clear whether this promising trend will continue in 2019, it is clear that the more than $230 million in federal funding that the state has received is making a tremendous impact. We have used these resources and the momentum of the crisis to collaborate, modernize, and innovate using dollars across the full continuum in prevention, we reduced opioid prescribing by 25%, developed prescribing guidelines, incorporated addiction content into medical school curriculums, and established over 800 prescription drug take-back boxes across the state. In treatment, we established a naloxone standing order and distributed over 55,000 free kits. 
developed a warm handoff model that's been used over 6,400 times, expanded treatment capacity through 45 centers of excellence and eight hub and spoke programs, increased our DEA X waiver physicians to over 4,000, offered loan repayment, awarded 3 point million to expand sport supports for pregnant women and women with children, and expanded MAT into our state correctional institutions. In terms of recovery support, we awarded 2.1 million to expand community recovery services, developed a website to share recovery stories and spread hope, and awarded grant funds to build recovery housing supports. In coming months, Pennsylvania will be focused on integrating quality into our four major goals of reducing stigma, intensifying primary prevention, strengthening the treatment system, and empowering sustained recovery. Without sustainable federal funding, the collaboration necessary to accomplish these goals will be greatly diminished. Although we've made significant strides, our work is not done and we need your help. In terms of funding, we need flexibility to address the system, not a substance. We need consistency with funding vehicles and reporting mechanisms where possible, such as utilizing the block grant as well as continued use of the single state authority as the central coordinating entity. Sustainability to allow for the continued relationship fostering, stigma reduction, and integration of services. Moving an entire system of care is a monumental task. We're working diligently and we've made staggering progress, but please don't give up. The long-term success of our programs and communities depends on sustained funding and support. Just two other quick considerations would be to address stigma in a more uniform way across the nation through language and action, and to seek ways to address the dire workforce shortage challenges experienced by every state. Thank you again for allowing me to share what Pennsylvania is doing and our suggestions for moving the system forward. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you so much, and don't worry, we don't intend to give up. Uh, Dr. Burrell, you're recognized now for five minutes. Chair DeGette, Ranking Member Guthrie, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. In my role as Commissioner of Public Health and as the state's chief physician, I'm dedicated to addressing the opiate epidemic in Massachusetts. I commend Congress and our federal agencies for funding those working tirelessly on the front lines every day. Our data indicates that in Massachusetts, our public health-centered approach to the opiate epidemic is working. I'm heartened to let you know that from 2016 to 2018, our opiate overdose deaths have declined by 4%. We continue to focus on prevention and education, naloxone availability, medication treatment, behavioral health counseling, and sustained recovery supports. We have made progress, but it's still unacceptable that nearly 2,000 individuals in Massachusetts die from this preventable disease each year. In my clinical practice, I cared for people with this disease, and I never forget that behind these numbers which we will talk about today are real people, their families, and their communities. Since 2016, we have been awarded approximately $159 million in federal funding specific to opiate use disorder prevention, treatment, and recovery. And we've allocated approximately $111 million of those funds. We've used federal funding to support expansion and enhancement of our treatment system through a data-driven approach that targets high risk, high need priority populations and disparities with the goal of reducing opiate overdoses and deaths. In 2015, Governor Baker appointed a working group who developed an action plan emphasizing data to identify hotspots and deploy appropriate resources. Additionally, a law referred to as the Public Health Data Warehouse enabled us to link 28 different data sets across state government and establish a public-private partnership to maximize the use of data to study this major public health crisis. This was unprecedented in Massachusetts. So our approach started with data analytics and research, allowing us to gain a deep understanding of who was dying, where and why, so that new investments could be strategic and impactful. Our data led us, led us to quickly focus our efforts on five key populations that we saw were still suffering from overdoses and overdose deaths. Persons released from incarceration, communities of color, 
persons with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders, people with a history of homelessness, and mothers with opiate use disorder. Our data showed, in fact, that the rate of opiate overdose death for mothers with opiate use disorder was more than 300 times higher for mothers without it. In response, one of the programs we set up was Moms Do Care, which is currently 100% federally funded. This innovative approach built a seamless, integrated continuum of care for pregnant and parenting women with substance use disorder. It provides access to medications, prenatal and postnatal care, maternity and pediatric care, behavioral health counseling, and peer-to-peer -peer recovery supports, and so much more. With federal friends, we are also supporting and expanding our prescription drug monitoring program, allowing all Massachusetts prescribers enhanced access to this vital system. While we have had many successes, we do see opportunities for federal assistance so we can continue to make progress. This includes funding that is flexible. When funding requirements restrict us to addressing only opiates, states are limited in our flexibility to address the changing landscape of substance use disorder. Flexibility would enable us to address other substances connected to this epidemic, such as cocaine and methamphetamines. Additionally, there are currently federal barriers to medication-assisted treatment, such as methadone and buprenorphine, and these barriers should be removed. This would allow medication-assisted treatment to be regulated more similarly to other chronic disease treatments and available in traditional health healthcare settings to increase access and reduce stigma. In conclusion, we are grateful to Congress for the commitment to address this opiate epidemic. Much of our progress can be attributed to federal funding we receive, and I encourage Congress to continue these critical funding efforts. This crisis did not build overnight, and it will take time to reverse. Addiction is not a choice, it is a disease. And with the continued support of our federal partners, we will build a solution to tackle this epidemic in Massachusetts and in this country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Mullinger, recognized now for five minutes. Thank you. Chairwoman DeGette, ranking members, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Christina Mullins, and I am the commissioner for the Bureau for Behavioral Health within the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources. And I also serve as a member of the National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors. First, I want to thank you for your commitment to address this crisis. Without the resources provided by this committee, West Virginia would be in a considerably worse position. I also want to thank you for the opportunity to discuss the importance of the initiatives in West Virginia to address the opioid crisis and the impact of the funding made available through this committee to promote prevention, treatment, and recovery for substance use disorder. It is no secret that West Virginia has been ground zero of the opioid crisis with the highest overdose rate in the nation. There are award-winning documentaries and Pulitzer Prize-winning stories that describe what happened to our state. And I am sure these efforts have played a significant role in bringing much needed resources to West Virginia. But today I would like to tell you a different story. With your help, West Virginia has reduced overdose deaths for the first time in over 10 years. Both opioid prescriptions and opioid doses have decreased by about 50%, while naloxone prescribing has increased by 208%. <coughs> Additionally, we have distributed over 10,000 doses of naloxone to local health departments. Treatment capacity has been transformed. The number of people that can prescribe buprenorphine has more than doubled from 243 to 584 since 2017. We have increased the number of residential treatment beds from 197 to 740, and our records indicate that those beds are about 85% full at about all times. Additionally, nearly all birthing facilities have access to integrated substance use disorder treatment in their community. This extraordinary increase in infrastructure and capacity is the result of the significant financial investment of federal, state, and drug settlement funds. West Virginia leveraged federal investments to increase outpatient treatment capacity, increase the number and quality of its workforce, distribute life-saving naloxone, conduct rigorous provider education on opioid prescribing, increased evidence-based prevention programs, and stood up quick response teams to follow up on individuals who experienced non-fatal overdoses. In addition to these efforts, the state also increased its infrastructure for surveillance and data analysis, and this work drives all of our programmatic decision making. The state complemented the work of its federal projects by using settlement funds and general revenue to undertake the development of construction projects 
that expanded the availability of residential treatment, including facilities that specialize in pregnant and postpartum women. The scope of this problem required a historic financial investment to adequately respond to this crisis. Braiding funding sources allowed West Virginia to balance the need for immediate interventions and services with the long-term need to address the systemic issues that serve as an ongoing challenge to the state's opioid response. While significant progress has been made, certain barriers and challenges remain. West Virginia continues to experience substantial workforce shortages, gaps in training related to psychostimulants and polysubstance use, a lack of capacity to serve children impacted by this crisis. In addition, a key concern when utilizing time-limited grant dollars is sustainability of efforts in thinking about a bigger, longer-term investment if these endeavors are to have a continuing impact in increasing treatment availability and reducing overdose death. The predictable and sustained provision of resources is key to allow states and providers to plan and rely on future year commitments. It can be tough to successfully plan and operate programs if providers are not confident resources will be available beyond a one-year commitment. It would be difficult to believe that West Virginia could have accomplished so much without the support of this committee. These funds have allowed West Virginia to have the resources that it needed to respond to this crisis and resulted in a decrease in overdose deaths and transformed our system of care. Our overdose deaths are down at this point, our records say by 10%. The financial resources are crucial to our continuing success and maintaining momentum. Ongoing funding for state alcohol and drug agencies to coordinate substance use prevention, treatment, recovery services at the state level will ensure continued progress. While barriers remain, West Virginia is better poised to address future challenges and continue its forward progress. In summary, West Virginia wishes to say thank you to this committee, SAMHSA and CDC. Thank you for your support, thank you for the resources, and thank you for allowing us to share what is happening and what is working in West Virginia. Thank you. Uh, now, Mr. Kinsley, I'd like to recognize you for five minutes. Good morning. Thank you, Chair DeGette, Ranking Member Guthrie, and the honorable members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to testify on North Carolina's response to the opioid epidemic. On behalf of the 10.4 million North Carolinians, approximately 426,000 of whom misuse prescription or illicit opioids, I want to express my deepest gratitude for your support of funding that has helped us turn the tide on the epidemic. This investment has saved lives, transformed communities, and has made the down payment on breaking the cycle of addiction, trauma, and poverty in our state. I'm also grateful to the committed staff of numerous federal agencies that have worked quickly to support a concerted strategy working across interconnected systems of healthcare, housing, employment, and justice. North Carolina was hit hard by the crisis. In 2016, 1,407 North Carolinians died of an unintended opioid overdose. For each death, there were six overdose hospitalizations, and we were one of the top eight states for fentanyl overdose deaths. Since the start of the epidemic, nearly 100,000 workers have been kept out of the workforce because of opioid misuse alone. Today, close to half of the children in North Carolina's foster care system have parental substance use as a factor in their out-of-home placement. And of course, the human cost, the loss to communities and families, is immeasurable. The scale of the problem underpins our magnitude for accomplishment. Our state's comprehensive response, the North Carolina Opioid Action Plan, is organized into three pillars, prevention, harm reduction, and connections to care. These pillars encompass numerous strategies, all made possible because of federal funding. Cutting the supply of inappropriate opioid prescriptions, making access to life-saving naloxone ubiquitous, supporting syringe exchange programs, making addiction medicine a core of medical education, partnering with county and local communities, launching interventions at the start of treatment <clears throat> that start treatment at the time of overdose reversal, and blending together broader efforts that support recovery into housing, employment, and address the root causes of substance use disorder. With these efforts, North Carolina saw the first decline in deaths in five years, decreasing 9% between 2017 and 2018. We've also seen a 24% decline in opioid prescribing and a 20% increase in the number of uninsured individuals receiving treatment. One million North Carolinians do not have health insurance. And half of the opioid overdose visits to the emergency room are uninsured. Therefore, our highest priority has been expanding evidence-based treatment to those without insurance. We have focused on medication-assisted treatment as the gold standard of care, providing treatment to an additional 12,000 people. 
Our success is clear, but with your help, there is much more we can do. We could stretch grandfathers, grant dollars further if doctors were no longer required to obtain a separate DEA waiver to prescribe buprenorphine for addiction. There is no additional waiver requirement to prescribe the exact same medication when it's being prescribed for other conditions. We should strengthen our focus on justice-involved populations. A recent study found that exiting North Carolina pri prisons were prisoners leaving North Carolina prisons were 40 times more likely to die of an opioid overdose than the general population. We are grateful to have recently received a $6.5 million grant from the Department of Justice to create pre-arrest diversion programs and expand jail-based treatment in our state. But with 56 prisons and 96 jails, we have a long way to go. But most significant of all would be giving us more time. Sustaining funding over longer windows of time or permanently would allow states to ready systems for the next wave of the epidemic. That wave is already cresting as we're starting to see rising rates of overdose deaths from methamphetamine and benzodiazepine. Before major federal funding for this epidemic became available, 12,000 people in North Carolina had already died. Meanwhile, <clears throat> North Carolina's share of the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant had not changed in recent years, while North Carolina was one of the fastest growing populations in the country, growing 9% between 2010 and 2018. Growing the block grant at pace with population and inflationary costs and an updated allocation formula would allow states to make better use of short-term funding, prevent the next epidemic, and save lives. Most of all, safeguarding Medicaid expansion and the Affordable Care Act is critical to our long-term success in fighting the opioid epidemic. States with higher rates of insurance coverage have more sustainable way of providing treatment and are able to prioritize their precious federal block grant dollars and opioid response grants on system investments. This is why we are working hard every day to expand Medicaid in North Carolina. In closing, I want to applaud the, flex the flexibility of much of the federal funding we have, we have received, which has allowed each state to respond to its own pressing needs. Our strategies are working, but our eyes are on the horizon. We appreciate your leadership, and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Dr. Alexander Scott, you are now recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Chairwoman DeGette, Ranking Member Guthrie, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to join you today to discuss Rhode Island's efforts to address the opioid overdose epidemic. Collaboration between states, federal agencies, and federal leaders such as yourselves is critical to our shared goals of preventing overdoses and saving lives. This issue has taken a staggering toll on my state. Since I became the director of the Rhode Island Department of Health in 2015, an overdose death has occurred in every city and town in Rhode Island. During this time, more Rhode Islanders have lost their lives to drug overdoses than to car crashes, firearms, and fires combined. Almost immediately after coming into office in 2015, Governor Gina Raimondo formed an overdose prevention and intervention task force to develop a centralized, strategic, data-driven, comprehensive plan to prevent overdoses. The task force includes stakeholders and experts in various fields, including public health, law enforcement, behavioral health, community-based support services, education, veterans affairs, and recovery. As a co-chair of this task force, I have helped steer our efforts into our four focus areas, prevention, treatment, recovery, and rescue, or reversal. We have changed the culture of prescribing in Rhode Island and have dramatically reduced our prescribing numbers. We now have a vast statewide treatment network in place, we have cultivated a group of certified peer recovery specialists who walk side by side with people in recovery. We have put thousands of naloxone kits onto the streets. And most importantly, we have started to give people hope and we're focusing at the community level. We have learned that regardless of your race or ethnicity, regardless of your zip code, income, or insurance status, every door for every person should make treatment and recovery services available. We believe that addiction is a disease and recovery is possible. One prime example is the story of Jonathan Goyer from East Providence, Rhode Island. Jonathan became dependent on opioids at 16 years of age. At 25, after more than 30 tries and after reaching depths that many of us could not fathom, 
he was finally able to find, sustain, and maintain a life in long-term recovery. He is now thriving as an expert advisor to Governor Raimondo's task force, and he leads our state's recovery-friendly workplace program. When you talk to Jonathan about his journey, he says, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. This is true for every community. We're trying to make the connection and the sense of community that brought Jonathan and so many others back from the brink a part of every overdose prevention effort we put in place in Rhode Island. We have had some success. After the number of drug overdose deaths increased each year in Rhode Island for the better part of a decade, that number decreased by 6.5% between 2016 and 2018. However, significant challenges remain. Fentanyl-related overdose deaths continue to increase, and the opioid conversation must be considered within the larger context of an addiction epidemic that has alcoholism, tobacco use, cocaine use, and other substances involved. We can broaden the scope even further to talk about the health implications of social and emotional isolation and the need to address the root causes of these challenges in our communities. All of this requires us to look beyond what many believe to be our traditional focus areas in public health. We need to look at the socioeconomic and environmental determinants of health, which determine roughly 80% of what makes you healthy and what makes me healthy. These are factors like access to quality education, access to fresh fruits and vegetables, and reliable transportation. We need to ensure that all children grow up in homes and go to schools where they feel safe, supported, and loved, to ensure that people have the houses that are healthy, safe, and affordable, and to ensure that people have jobs that offer fair pay. This is a part of our response. The efforts and the progress that I've outlined today would not have been possible without the tremendous contributions of Congress and the federal agencies you fund. I thank you for that sincerely, and I look forward to partnering with you to address what lies ahead on behalf of Rhode Island and on behalf of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, where I serve as immediate past president. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. It's now time for members to ask questions, and the chair will recognize herself for five minutes. As I mentioned in my opening statement, and as many of you mentioned, and thank you, uh, the committee has really been focusing on the opioid epidemic for quite some number of years. And this subcommittee in particular, um, in the last few Congresses, I was the ranking Democrat, now I'm the chair, but it's been a real bipartisan effort over the years to help address this crisis. And ultimately under, uh, um, of course, um, a number of pieces of legislation and the 21st Century Cures Act, which Congress Congressman Upton and I sponsored, we provided the states with an, a considerable amount of funds to address substance abuse. And so we're happy to see that some of those funds have been used as part of your efforts. Uh, but several of you mentioned that, that um, we need to give more flexibility to the states to address, I, I believe, um, Ms. Smith, you said, to address the system, not the substance. And I'm wondering if some of you can talk about what we need to do to give that flexibility as, as some of the substances shift. Uh, Ms. Smith, do you want to um, expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks for asking that question. Um, and this goes to, in, in many of your opening remarks, uh, you mentioned about the polysubstance use and the increase in particularly methamphetamine and cocaine that many states across the nation are seeing. Um, and I think one of the challenges has been for us with the funding being so focused on opioids, mm -hmm. it's been a little bit challenging depending on the types of programs that we wanted to establish in making sure that we were appropriately tying it to opioids, while at the same time recognizing that some folks who benefit from the program may not identify opioids as their primary substance or even identify them at all as a substance. Do, do that you think utilizing. that that's getting 
getting more noticeable that people are moving from opioids? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Mr. Kinsley, you're shaking your head yes. Are you seeing that as well? Absolutely. We're seeing that in North Carolina. And I think that in North Carolina, the Substance Abuse Prevention Treatment Block Grant is the only real sustainable we tool, tool we have to build the workforce and build the treatment sources for those individuals to go to to get ahead of the problem. Dr. Alexander Scott, um, you, you talked a lot about what Rhode Island is trying to do. What about this crisis are you dealing with now that you weren't able to see a couple of years ago? Are, are there some new things that you're seeing now? Certainly the increase in uh, the percent of uh, fentanyl with overdose deaths is occurring. We are seeing also an, an increase in poly substances, multiple substances involved with overdose deaths. And we've recognized the importance of going upstream more to really get at the root causes of what um, is driving many of the, the challenges associated with both mental health and substance use. And, and do you think that, that um, the federal, the, feder the language with some of the federal funds you're getting is too restrictive for trying to address some of those issues? There is opportunity to be more deliberate in allowing for the flexibility so that we can look more upstream and engage more at the community level. Ms. Mullins, um, what would you say the key challenge your face is, it, state is facing right now with addiction? Right now, my key challenge is workforce. I do not have enough people to deliver the treatment that is needed for the state. We're in, we could open up uh, more days for prescribers, but we do not have the therapists uh, to be able to support that prescribing. And Dr. Burrell, I wanted to ask you, um, in your written testimony, you said that Massachusetts utilize federal funding to support expansion and enhancement of our treatment system. Can you tell me specifically about um, how the federal funds enabled you to do that and what could be done more if you had more flexibility? Absolutely. Um, thank you for your leadership in this area. So what we've been doing in our public health approach to this opiate epidemic is focusing on, of course, prevention and interventions, but really enhancing our treatment system. And as, a, as has been said before, what we're dealing with now, many of us, is trying to build a system in a place that where for behavioral health issues in general, um, for many, many decades have been underfunded. So we're really trying to build up systems of care so that individuals can get the treatment that they need. We have used some of our federal fundings to enhance um, treatment opportunities, including increasing um, our treatment beds within our system to over 1,200, including increasing um, training and availability of office-based opioid treatments uh -huh. and enhancing availability of methadone through thank opioid you. treatment programs. So I just want to, um, again, I want to thank all of you for your efforts and let you know this committee and the full Energy and Commerce Committee is is committed to helping um, make the maximum flexibility. I'll remind you that in the, in the recent federal 2020 government funding bill, Congress continues to invest $1.5 billion in SAMHSA's state opioid response grants. And so um, in, in response to the changing drug abuse landscape, we allowed grantees to use this funding to address stimulant use. But if there's more we can do, please let us know because you, we want you to consider ourselves to be your partners with that. I will recognize Mr. Guthrie for five minutes for questioning. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. and appreciate you all being here and telling your stories and uh, talking about bipartisan. You asked a lot of the questions that I had originally that was gonna move forward. So I'm moving forward, y'all, uh, and, and y'all have answered them well. And, and I guess one thing I want to get at flexibility, and I remember when we did the markup on, on I guess it was the Support Act, or it might have been the Comprehensive Recovery Act, but uh, our colleague on the committee, Bobby Rush, I don't know if he had an amendment or he, or he just made a point that different communities have different, different issues and all opioids are in every community. He was speaking specifically on his. I remember the discussion being on, there's X amount of resources we're, gonna, we're focusing on here. And I guess my hope is as you bring more workers using the money, you can... You can't always use this opioid money for somebody and another substance, but it helps you build the infrastructure that has the same kind of moving forward. And, and we do need to open up and look at that. that that's something I think we absolutely need to look at. Uh, as we were having, uh, uh, something that was interesting to me and I, is that as we were having a hearing, when it was a hearing or a round table, we had a couple that had a son that, was, that had passed away. We had some families that experienced that and they talked about the patient brokering and it just walked away with just, appalling that, that there seem to be not any states that you represent 
but he was in a state and was just being sent from one brokerage to another. And I know a couple of you guys, a couple of states have looked at that. And I think Dr. Alexander Scott in Rhode Island has looked at patient brokering. So it's my understanding that Rhode Island certifies recovery housing and started this certification two years ago. Can you talk about the certification process, why Rhode Island started it, and about how many recovery homes you have certified? Yes, thank you. Well, I'll be happy to provide additional information um, to support this. Our sister agency, the Department of Behavioral Healthcare, Developmental Disabilities and Hospitals, recognized the importance of having social determinants of health addressed, such as housing. And recovery housing is a critical tool for supporting those living the lives of recovery, like Jonathan that I mentioned earlier. Um, we wanted to make sure that there was a level of quality and standards across all of the recovery houses that were available. And this sister agency um, in Rhode Island oversees the certifications to help establish those standards. Um, I can get back to you on the official number that we okay. have of recovery houses that are available, um, but this has been a quality and data-driven program that we have felt to be critical to supporting this opioid epidemic. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, I think uh, Pennsylvania, it's my understanding that in the, the last year, Pennsylvania passed legislation that enables the Department of Drug and Alcohol programs to regulate and license recovery housing. Uh, that receives federal funding. Can you talk about why you needed to do this and, and uh, the effect of it and when it goes into effect? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it was passed uh, by the legislature um, and our governor for the same reasons that it, it was in other states like Rhode Island. Um, we were definitely identifying issues both through parents, through advocacy groups, through individuals who were attending um, recovery housing events and noticing that there seemed to be some inconsistencies with practices. Um, and so we felt it was really critical to pass some kind of legislation that enables us to have some oversight of these entities. What's interesting is in Pennsylvania, we, we don't really know the exact number of current recovery houses operating. We know that it's in the thousands. Um, and so what this legislation will enable us to do is create regulations so that any house that receives referrals or funding from state or federal entities will have to be licensed by our department. So it won't require that every recovery house in Pennsylvania be licensed, but the hope is um, that folks are utilizing the website that contains the licensing information to utilize those licensed entities that they know have some level of quality services, and maybe it will um, reduce business at some of the more scrupulous uh, entities. Okay, thank you. I have a cousin who's a neonatologist, and he never talks about any individual patient, but just the issue in general when we talk a lot about this. And so I know that there, in the, um, for the opioid uh, mother, neonatal abstinence syndrome, so I, and I only have a few seconds, so maybe one of you, have, have any of you used federal dollars for the neonatal abstinence syndrome, and has that reduced it in your state? And whoever wants to go first, probably one of you get time to answer. Anybody working with that specifically? Uh, West Virginia is working very specifically to provide treatment to women affected by um, a substance use disorder. Uh, it doesn't, the treatment itself sometimes can increase neonatal abstinence syndrome with the use of medication assisted treatment, but our babies are being born healthier, their birth outcomes are better. So we're really optimistic that with continued effort there, we can make more progress. Okay, thank you. I yield back. And I recognize this, uh, Mr. Pallone for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. As, as Congress and the committee consider further action on the opioid crisis, I, I'd like to hear more about how federal funds have been used to make a difference. And based on the state submissions to the committee, which I mentioned in my opening, it appears several states have successfully used federal funds to respond to the crisis. So let me see how many I can get through here. Um, Mr. Kinsley, um, in your testimony, you noted that federal funding has enabled North Carolina to provide opiate use disorder treatment for 12,000 uninsured people. In the same testimony, you mentioned that, and I quote, since 2016, when the first of the major federal opioid grants was received, North Carolina saw its first decline in opiate overdose deaths in five years, decreasing 9% from 2017 to 18. So what factors do you attribute North Carolina's success in reducing overdose deaths and providing treatment to people who really need it. Thank you. Um, 
our focus has been 100% on medication-assisted treatment and uh, naloxone distribution in communities. I believe the naloxone distribution has been directly tied to the halt in deaths and the reduction in deaths that we have seen. Um, and after that, important programs that have linked individuals into care have been able to sustain that treatment and move individuals into recovery. Programs like peer support specialists, individuals who are in recovery themselves, we've placed them in emergency departments. Uh, we've worked with our local EMS providers to actually induct people into treatment so that if an individual who has an opioid reversal through an EMS visit uh, does not want to go to the hospital, they can actually begin their treatment then, and there's a follow-up uh, group of folks that come out and see those individuals after the fact. So it's been a lot of uh, very scaled, very strategic, focused interventions like that that have moved people into recovery and into the treatment pipeline that have been really important for us in North Carolina. Thanks. Let me go to Ms. Smith. I was encouraged to hear from your testimony that Pennsylvania has witnessed an 18% decrease in overdose deaths from 2017 to 18. So what factors do you attribute the reduction to and what are the few key areas that Pennsylvania should focus on to continue that trend if possible? Yeah, I think the keys for us is not all that different, actually. Um, a big focus on getting naloxone into communities, big focus on what we call a warm handoff process, which is getting overdose survivors from the hospital into treatment. Uh, we had a, a major issue in our hospitals and health systems with individuals overdosing and then being quickly released uh, back out onto the streets to overdose again, uh, repeated times. So I think those two things have been um, key for us. I think moving forward, what we'd like to do is spend a little bit more time and energy in the prevention space, trying to prevent before we get to worrying about needing naloxone and needing to activate the warm handoff process. Um, but our, our primary focus was really keeping people alive. Now that we've started to get a handle on that through naloxone and warm handoff and, and expanding treatment, now I think we can spend some time and energy really thinking about looking upstream and how do we improve our prevention efforts. Okay, thank you. Let me go to Dr. Alexandra Scott with regard to Rhode Island's response to the committee. You noted that federal funds have enabled the state to improve data and surveillance, expand treatment capacity, and support innovations in delivery and treatment. Can you give us some specific examples of how federal funds have helped Rhode Island in those areas? There are multiple examples similar to what has been mentioned. Since you asked about data specifically, um, we use data in as real time as possible. We uh, obtain 48-hour reporting from our emergency departments for any suspected or um, actual overdose that has occurred. And on a weekly basis, we have a cross-agency team that assesses where overdoses are, um, GIS mapped across the state, and we release advisories to municipalities, key stakeholders, and providers um, to focus their areas when the overdose deaths have increased beyond a certain threshold. That allows us to drive out the um, resources and services that we have based on data in real time at the local level, which is one example. We continue to um, expand treatment and um, uh, recovery uh, services with the intention of meeting people where they are. So going out to um, reach folks through a mobile recovery and uh, treatment um, uh, vehicle is another example. Thank you. I don't know if I can get West Virginia in. Ms. Mullins noted that the state's treatment system has been completely overhauled in response to the opioid crisis, and much of the positive work to date has occurred with her, been made possible as a direct result of the federal funds awarded since 2016. Do you want to give us briefly some examples of how federal funds have let West Virginia provide treatment and recovery services, particularly in rural and financially disadvantaged parts of the state? Yeah, specifically, really, in, it has given us the ability to expand our um, clinical providers who could provide MAT. We now have people in all of our 55 counties able to um, receive MAT, and then um, we have pre prescribers in, located physically in most counties. That's been the number one success we've really experienced with the federal funds. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I now recognize this gentleman from Oregon for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks again for the hearing and to our witnesses. Thanks for your participation as well. Um, I want to start with a, a question about transportation issues. Um, 
It, it's a big problem in a district like mine. Just put in perspective, mine would stretch from the Atlantic to Ohio. It's bigger than almost any state east of the Mississippi. Um, at my round tables in the second district of Oregon, 2017, I, I heard from a woman in Hermiston how she had to travel five hours uh, into another state, Washington State, just to find a provider who would help her with treatment and get her off for her addiction. For each of the witnesses, what's your state doing to address access to treatment faced by rural patients uh, where there's no local help? Um, and if you could be kind of brief on that, because I got another one on 42 CFR Part 2 I want to get to as well. So if anybody wants to weigh in on, on, on how to help in the rural areas, anything? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, North Carolina has 100 counties. We have, uh, we are dosing currently about 20,000 people a day in our opioid treatment programs. I think our largest two strategies to uh, address rural access has been first and foremost, uh, moving as much care into office-based outpatient treatment programs as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why we'd love to see the, the data X waiver requirement removed to try to make that easier. Uh, we've doubled the number of physicians in North Carolina. We have a long way to go. We're not going to get large scale OTP providers there. The second, we've been heavily investing in Project ECHO, which has uh, leveraged our ability to try to train providers to give them the support they need to take on these patients. Yeah, we, as you know, in the Sport Act, expanded who could administer uh, Suboxone and, and other treatment. Anybody else want to weigh in on, on this? Yeah, I'd be happy to very quickly. Um, so Pennsylvania is really fortunate in that we have a, a large number of um, opioid treatment providers already in the state. Um, so that's an advantage for us. But beyond that, to assist rural communities, we have a, a particular ramp grant, we call it Rural Access to Medication, where we are expanding access to medication-assisted treatment in rural areas thanks to grant from the federal government as well as we've offered a loan repayment program for practitioners in areas that are hard hit by the opioid epidemic but also have workforce shortages, which you can imagine is mostly rural areas. Um, and the commitment for that loan repayment program is that you have to have two years of experience treating SUD patients and you have to commit to an additional two years uh, treating so in that area. To stay. Okay. Yes. I want, I want to move on to uh, this 42 uh, CFR Part 2 issue, the, uh, the confidentiality of alcohol and drug abuse patient records. Um, I heard a lot from providers about how uh, this impact impacts negatively the effective exchange of information regarding individual substance use disorder treatment um, and their, their, phys their other health issues. Um, we passed legislation in the House overwhelmingly to try and address this, protect patient privacy, but allow the right flow of information to other medical providers. Tragically, it, it went up on the rocks in the Senate, um, and I'd like to see us re renew our efforts here. Um, can you all tell me briefly, just are you, are you seeing patients impacted by this? I sure heard it from providers in my district. Yes, doctor? In Massachusetts, we provided comments related to 42 CFR and some of the obstacles that that um, produces. As we have started to think about what is the next step of what needs to happen to fight this opiate epidemic, one of the issues is around appropriate behavioral health integration, both with mental health issues right. and substance use issues, as well as how to connect that to the medical um, care that an individual needs. And there are many aspects of 42 CFR that are an obstacle there. Okay. Others run into this? Yeah, doctor. Yeah, the place to be aware of um, where it may be considered is within the school system, making sure that um, uh, school nurses and psychologists are able to exchange the information needed to care for children who have mental health or even substance use uh, challenges. Okay. Others want to comment on this? Mr. Kinsley? North Carolina is fully supportive of modernizing 42 CFR uh, in attempt to both maintain privacy but also move us to integrated care. I think what's important is that we have to also systematically address stigma to help reduce right. the systematic exclusion of individuals from employment, housing, and everything else that they experience exactly. as well. Exactly. Anyone else? Ms. Smith? He said exactly what I was going to say, that really addressing he was stigma looking at your notes, I guess. Has, to be, has to be the primary concern here. You know, I, yep. I think it's important to protect um, those individuals who suffer Absolutely. from this disease, um, but at the same time, I don't know how we move to a truly integrated system of care when we treat their records differently. We keep talking right. about treat them the same as everyone else, treat them the same as someone who has heart disease or diabetes, but accept their medical records. Right. Which I think is, we need to change that conversation. Which has led to deaths. 
So um, we need to fix this. I hope we can, Madam Chair, renew this effort uh, to, to pass a reform here. I know the administration's done some things they could within the existing law, but I don't think that goes far enough, and you've been generous This is, this is an issue we've been working on for a long, long yeah. time in this committee, and we do, need, we do need to find a resolution. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Thank Chair, you to all of you. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. In 2018, the overall rate of op opioid overdose deaths in Illinois fell for the first time in five years. The decrease was likely impacted by the efforts of this committee and Congress to combat the opioid epidemic. But this trend was primarily driven by the decline in deaths among white residents. Today, in Illinois, opioid overdose deaths among blacks and Latinos um, continue to rise. In fact, my hometown of Chicago experienced more opioid um, overdose deaths than homicides in 2017. Of the 796 people who died from opioid, overdose, uh, op opioid deaths that year, 400 were African American. And as a uh, and a recent study from the American Journal of Public Health found that black and Hispanic residents of Cook County, Illinois, were more likely to experience a fentanyl-involved overdose than whites. That doesn't square with the sort of public perception of the opioid crisis as a white, suburban, and rural issue. Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, Dr. Alexander Scott, um, I know you have experience not only in your state, but as, as the president, former president of the Association of State and Territorial Health um, Officials. Can you tell us how the Congress, how we can help um, states to address the overlooked uh, racial disparities in the opioid epidemic? Thank you so much for this question. It's such a critical issue for us. We in Rhode Island are also starting to take a more deliberate approach at addressing this by really making sure that we have a health equity lens in terms of how we are um, implementing our overdose prevention and intervention efforts. We have to make sure that every community that is impacted by this has the opportunity to have access to um, the treatment services as well as continue to look upstream to address the root causes that exist. We cannot overlook the socioeconomic and environmental determinants that are occurring in various communities. And, and I appreciate that uh, Congressman Guthrie raise this question to some extent as well, so go ahead. Um, to be able to uh, tackle this. The start is with what you have done, which is really expose the fact that um, different races and ethnicities are impacted by this epidemic in different ways, and we have to make sure that we are taking into account the the cultural and um, socioeconomic and environmental um, influences that are contributing to why we have these different outcomes and really focus on addressing the root causes and making sure that the funding that you um, appropriate is able to take place at the community level and be driven by what the community needs to make the difference. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Um Barrel, is that right? Um, your testimony mentioned, in your testimony, you mentioned um, that you are focusing on communities of color in your state um, responses. And so what does that look like? Yes, thanks for bringing up this important issue. One of our five areas where we found we have seen an increase in overdoses and overdose deaths is in our communities of color. So we have been using federal funds to assist us in those efforts. To give you an example, as we've all noted, as our opiate overdose deaths thankfully have begun to decline, from 2016 to 2017, when we broke down our death data by race and ethnicity, we found that the only group still with an increasing rate of opiate overdose deaths was black men. So we have um, rerouted some of our efforts 
to be able to focus on communities of color. So just to give you a few examples, we um, redid some of our campaigns, including prevention campaigns, to address um, different communities and provide them in different languages. Additionally, another example is we have a licensed addiction counselor program that we have now focused on um, Latino and African Amer American members of our community so that more individuals can be trained and then go back to their communities to provide services. Thank you. I, I think the statistics are just completely unacceptable um, in Chicago and a lot of uh, metropolitan areas and especially among communities of, of color. And it would be a terrible mistake to go with just this overall data and not look at the um, particular communities. Thank you for responding to this question. I yield back. Thank you, gentlelady. Uh, now recognize the gentleman. Oh. I, I, I'm wondering if I could offer something uh, on, uh, something for the record as well, I forgot. Uh, yeah. Okay. What, what is if, I, if I could put in the study that I mentioned, the um, geographic distribution of fentanyl involved overdose deaths in Cook County, to, uh, in Cook County, Illinois, and U.S. News and World Report article titled, Separate, Unequal, and Overlooked. Without objection, both items will be entered into the record. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas. I thank the chair for the recognition. Uh, Dr. Burrell, just briefly, Mr. Guthrie had talked a little bit about uh, patient brokering. I will share with you some of the most troubling testimony we have had in this subcommittee on this issue was from your assistant attorney general, I think his name was Eric Gold, who came and testified to one of our oversight investigation subcommittees about so, uh, um, sober homes that were located in other states. So his Massachusetts residents would be lured to other locations to have their treatment and of course uh, all covered by, by insurance with no real identifiable metrics as to whether or not anyone was getting better. And in fact, I think he shared with us data that not only did they not get better, but he'd had a number of deaths of Massachusetts residents that had happened as a result of being farmed out to a, a sober home. So as kind of follow up to his testimony, is there anything that you're the state's uh, sort of chief medical officer, is there anything else that you can share with us about what he told us that day? Absolutely. So the quality of care that our patients receive in this system is absolutely critical that we all make sure it reaches the highest standards for this very vulnerable population. There's several things we do at the state level. We take very seriously our responsibility to license and contract with all of the substance addiction services that we provide through the Department of Public Health. And through that licensing and contracting authority, which has recently been enhanced actually through Massachusetts law, we are able to set the criteria and have a feedback loop. We also respond to um, complaints, do relicensing every two years, and can um, at any time go into an inspector site. I'll add specifically in terms of sober homes, we now in Massachusetts have a voluntary um, sober home certification program which much, must meet certain criteria and standards, and um, we've seen improvement and have over 2,000 beds in that system as well. Well, very good about that. And just to be clear, um, when Mr. Gold came and, and testified to us, he, he wasn't talking about sober homes within the state or within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He was talking about sober homes that might be in a, say, a more agreeable southern climate. Not that there's any more agreeable climate than Massachusetts in January, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but having never experienced that. Um, but that was the deal, that people would be, again, lured with, uh, okay, you can come spend your winter in a sunny location. and you all sort of lose control of the situation when that happens. So I guess what I'm asking is, are we doing any better as far as being able to communicate between states about when this type of activity happens, when you lose a resident uh, to addiction in another state? Are you, is there some type of follow-up that's done on that? 
So I don't have any specific example of a patient brokering to give you, and I can have the um, Attorney General's office follow up sure. to see what they can provide. But I will say one of the things we need to do in our state if people are leaving is make sure that we have the facilities and the appropriate access to care in the state, and we've been working really hard in that. One really important success that many of us have in terms of cross-state communication is the prescription monitoring programs, sure. and ours in um, Massachusetts, which now providers are required to use before prescribing opioids and benzodiazepines is connected to 37 other states and Washington, D.C., and that really helps understand care that individuals may have received in other states as well. And, of course, the whole uh, NASPER program was a product of this committee many, many years ago. I remember us working on it, as did we work on Project ECHO when uh, Orrin Hatch was over in the Senate Finance Committee. So thank you for mentioning Project ECHO. And, Mr. Kinsley, let me just ask you if I could, and Mr. Walden already addressed the 42 CFR Part 2 issue, but um, do you feel that in, within your state that your programs are able to share the appropriate addiction medical records so that they co can coordinate care with people undergoing treatment for opiate use disorder, substance use disorder? The simple answer is no. We have invested a lot of resources through uh, peer support and other tools to try to support that coordination of care, care management, et cetera, but there's still a huge limitation. and. Uh, even doctors within the same systems can't easily talk to one another to coordinate care around uh, their patients. Well, again, I would just, in agreement with Mr. Walden, I think we should redouble our efforts. We were, we got 42 CFR Part 2 reform done on the House floor uh, in 2018. We were not able, it didn't survive the Senate. So when President Trump signed the big bill into law, that part was removed. <laughs> We need, to, we need to continue to work on that because it's critically important. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll yield back. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank the witnesses uh, for being here today, your testimony. I want to thank uh, our colleagues as well on this committee for its attention. Um, Dr. Burgess, you're welcome to Boston anytime in winter. Um, the weather not, might not be the warmest. Super Bowl rings tend to warm you up, though, so we've had our, our share of those. Hopefully, it might be something you guys can experience sometime soon, but we're gonna move right along, Dr. Burrow. Um, you sit on the Massachusetts Harm Reduction Commission, uh, which in March 2019 recommended exploring the use of evidence-based safe injection facilities, or safe consumption sites. These sites are shown to reduce the risk of infection, improve public health outcomes, and increase outreach to treatment services. Safe injection facilities are supported by the Massachusetts Medical Society, and the implementation of these sites is currently being explored by the Massachusetts State Legislature. So, Dr. Burrell, can you elaborate a little bit about uh, how the Harm Reduction Commission uh, came to recommend piloting evidence-based safe injection facilities? And additionally, as addressed briefly in the report, could you explain why uh, the state uh, operated facilities do not violate federal law? Um, so, um, thank you, Congressman, and thank you for the support of the work happening in Massachusetts and around the country. Um, talking broadly about the Harm Reduction Commission, um, first to address the safe um, injection facilities, these were reviewed and the evidence was reviewed and a recommendation was to look at this further um, through our legislative process and I understand there to be legal barriers both at the state and federal level. Um, talking about harm reduction broadly and what we currently have the capacity to do in public health, um, we've really been focusing our effort on the high risk populations I've mentioned and one of the important harm reduction pieces in including um, syringe service programs. We've expanded those in Massachusetts from several years ago to less than 10 to over 30 now, and have had markedly good response rates of um, not only collecting syringes, but also providing harm reduction services, decreasing infections, and connecting people to care. Um, one statistic that's been very helpful for um, individuals is that for every um, 100 syringes that are handed out, 120 are returned, so really also cle cleaning out neighborhoods and communities as well. So we've had a um, focused effort in that, as well as um, outreach to communities highest, at highest risk. Other evidence-based treatment strategies, such as FDA-approved uh, drugs like buprenorphine, uh, methadone, and naltrexone, are considered the gold standard for treating those who suffer from opioid uh, use disorder. Uh, Doctor, our Commonwealth's response to uh, the committee indicated that the state has increased access to medication-assisted, excuse me, medication-assisted treatment to those who have been incarcerated and are re-entering the community. Can you describe the types of treatments Massachusetts is providing to the incarcerated population in the state? And if there's any disconnect, seeing as uh, 
individuals who are incarcerated lose Medicaid once they are incarcerated to any roadblocks to, that come from that uh, bureaucratic disconnect? Absolutely, I'm proud to say that one of the um, areas where we've had a lot of improvement is in treating individuals with incarceration. As I mentioned in my testimony, that one of our five high-risk groups. Um, in fact, we see from our data that when individuals are released from incarceration, the risk of opioid overdose death is 120 times higher mm -hmm. than other individuals, especially in the two to four weeks after release. That data and information really helped us open up dialogue in new ways with our criminal justice colleagues. And now the Department of Correction is offering FDA-approved um, medication um, for opioid use disorder, as well as a pilot happening in seven of our um, jail systems. We also are expanding our program of um, post-release assistance, because as has been mentioned earlier, individuals not only need to be connected to medications when they leave, but also employment and housing opportunities. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Kinsey, a study uh, published this read found, found that states that expanded Medicaid had a 6% overall lower rate of opioid use uh, or opioid overdose deaths than states that, would, that did not choose to expand Medicaid. For specific opioids, this rate was as high as 11% lower mortality. Unlike the other four states represented here today, obviously, uh, North Carolina decided not to expand Medicaid. Sir, um, has that diminished the state's ability to provide long-term evidence-based treatment options to uninsured citizens? Absolutely, and thank you for the question, Congressman. <clears throat> we estimate 426,000 people have an opioid or prescription misuse. Um, we have been able to provide treatment to 12,000 uninsured folks. Half of everybody coming into an ED room with an opioid overdose are uninsured. We are digging out of this hole with a teaspoon. We are proud of our progress. We have so much further to go. Based off the recent JAMA report that came out, we estimate 415 North Carolinians would be alive today had we expanded Medicaid in 2014. Thank you. Yield back. Gentleman from West Virginia is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'd like to enter into the record uh, this uh, a letter from the Voices from Non-Opioid Choices. Um, it's, it's a, it deals with the non-opioid options to treat an acute pain. I should have consent we had entered that. Without objections. Thank you. Um, I guess maybe to focus uh, uh, back on Ms. Mullins, uh, on your, some of your testimony, and, and first, I want to congratulate you uh, for West Virginia, the work you've done in that, uh, to be a, because like you said, We've been the epicenter of this problem. We've grown from 52 to 57 deaths per 100,000. Uh, it, it's just, it's incredible to see what's happened. My concern has been from the day one on this uh, uh, that we've never really understood the contributing factors that have led to, to abuse. Um, we've had people in here from NIH and CDC, they, They'll talk about the socioeconomic issues, and, and we've been able to quibble back and forth about, but there's states like New Hampshire that has an absolute opposite socioeconomic contributing factors as compared to West Virginia, and for years they were the number two in the country. So I'd like to, I'd like to understand more about what we're doing about prevention rather than the treatment. And from an engineering perspective, that's how we, when we have a building collapse or a building failure, we, we go back to find out what caused it. Uh, and then we can fix it, but let's so that it doesn't happen again. So my question back to you, what do you, what do you think the contributing factors are? Uh, because I look at, for example, uh, and, and I agree with Dr. Scott, who, who said it's about connectivity. I, I'm not, I wanna see how that goes together because Texas, Texas has a rate of only 10.5 to our 57. What are they doing right in Texas that we in West Virginia or maybe around the country can learn about what, what are they doing there? Because we know the drugs are coming across. It's not like we don't have access to these illegal drugs. We know they're, where they're coming from. What can we learn from that to prevent people from abusing drugs? So I think in terms of contributing factors, West Virginia experienced a perfect storm. We had um, prescribers trying to treat pain. We have individuals in high, high injury occupations, coal mining, and some of the other industries that we have in West Virginia are prone to accidents. So 
Then we had uh, influxes of pills coming into the state. We had easy availability. And those things were how the perfect storm, if you will, got started with low incomes and, and, and people, the, the recession and the different things that were happening, people becoming uh, frustrated. But I, in my opinion, we have to go further backstream. We have to start with our kids. We have kids in absolute okay. crisis. They're not living with their parents. They're living, many of them are living in foster let me, care. Let me interrupt on that. Yeah. I'd like to have more of a dialogue with you about this. So rather than take all the time, there are a couple more things because I'm concerned if we don't stop the prevention, if we don't get into the prevention, we're going to see even more neonatal uh, absence problem uh, with our children. We're going to see the impact it's going to have on foster families, foster children uh, in our foster homes uh, as a result of this. So I'm, I'm really curious about how we stop it in the first place or, or how we mitigate the, the problem into the future. So let me go. To, to the last comment I'd like to hear from any of you on the panel is that we know one of the tobacco settlement that occurred years ago, 97%, 97% of the money that came in for tobacco settlement payments went for non-tobacco use. They were used for fixing potholes. They were fixing, balancing state budgets. Should we do the same thing? Because I would imagine that we're gonna see quite a bit of litigation over this opioid, and there are gonna be some federal settlements on this. Is there a role for us, for the federal government, to try to step in to make sure that that money doesn't go for using potholes and balancing budgets? Is there some way that we can assure it'll go for things like prevention or foster care or neonatal uh, to, to assure long-term funding for people that are making investments in, in uh, treatment? What how would you react to a, a federal involvement in these settlements? Any of you? Thank you for the question, Congressman. We would um, welcome the opportunity to have sustainable funding that allows us to really focus on this epidemic comprehensively and over the long term. Uh, many of us have referenced the importance of stability with the funding, particularly when you look at making sure that the funding can be implemented at the community level. The community entities that we are engaged with need to know that the funding that's available to them to address determinants of health and to address a comprehensive system will be in place for a long enough time for there to be um, an impact um, and the improvement that we want to see. So the assistance that is um, welcome to help us do that across the board um, is certainly uh, to be well received. Gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much and thank you all for being here and for the incredible work that you're doing in your states. Uh, this committee has worked in a bipartisan manner over the last several years to pass legislation to help state implement programs to help curb the opioid crisis sweeping our nation, but uh, more can and more must be done. Uh, while members on both sides of the aisle are committed to addressing this issue, at the same time, there are continued efforts not to expand Medicaid in some states and even to make access to Medicaid more difficult uh, overall, uh, despite the fact that increased access to care means increased access to life-saving treatment. In fact, just last week, a new study was published in the Journal of the Association of uh, American uh, Medical Association, JAMA, found that expanding Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act may have saved as many as 8,000 people from fatal opioid overdose. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to insert this for the record. Without objection. And according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, another uh, study. Uh, in 2017, Medicaid covered 54% of people who received treatment for opioid use disorders. So despite the words about wanting to increase access to mental health and addiction treatment, there are also efforts to roll back the Affordable Care Act, which would eliminate coverage of the essential health benefits like mental health services and addiction treatment and repeal the Medicaid expansion. Um, if we truly want to address this crisis in a meaningful way, we need to work to increase coverage, expand Medicaid, not take it away. Time after time, I've cared for a patient who is overdosing in the emergency department. They usually come unresponsive and blue. Um, it, and in the emergency department, we treat everybody with a life-threatening illness, regardless of their ability to pay. 
But once they are stabilized and leave the emergency department, leave the hospital, they need to find treatment to help them beat their addiction. They need to go to the facilities that offer the programs that receive the grant money. And those facilities often benefit if they have the Medicaid. And if they don't have Medicaid, they won't go. Because the opioid epidemic is an unprecedented crisis, states have needed to make fundamental changes to their treatment systems to combat opioid addiction and substance use disorder. So I'd like to hear how federal funding has played a role in supporting these treatment systems. Ms. Uh, Mullins, West Virginia's response to the committee notes that the state's treatment infrastructure was initially not capable of meeting rising demand for opioid treatment services. How have the federal funds helped West Virginia enhance the treatment infrastructure system, including the role that Medicaid has played? So Medicaid has been a key component. Uh, we have um, used Medicaid. We were approved for an 11 t 1115 SUD waiver. So we have used that as part of our backbone to, to pay for treatment services. But the 1115 waiver doesn't, doesn't enable us to train our providers. It doesn't enable us to build our infrastructure. So we use the grant funds to wrap around that waiver and build infrastructure, as well as cover people with no insurance or who are underinsured. That has been our strategy uh, to, to braid those funds together. And I don't think that we could have done one without the other. And according to a recent study, opioid treatment is much more widely accessed in states that expanded Medicaid. Rhode Island and West Virginia, two Medicaid expanded states, both noted in their responses to the committee the importance of federal Medicaid dollars and their ability to address the opioid crisis. Mr. Kinsley, uh, North from North Carolina, correct? You raised in your written statement that Medicaid is, quote, the most important tool in a sustainable response to the opioid epidemic and would bring an additional $4 billion into North Carolina for health care. How would expanding Medicaid help the state further develop its treatment infrastructure to address the opioid crisis? Thank you for the question. Uh, the interconnection with substance use disorder and employment and the fact that the vast majority of individuals get their health insurance through employment cannot be overlooked. I remind my team every day that they're potentially one drug test away from losing their health insurance and ending up in a place where they have no way to pay for the treatment that they need to recover and get back into the employment workforce. In North Carolina, we estimate that 500,000 additional people would have insurance with Medicaid expansion. Those would be our ability to then shift those individuals to get treatment through Medicaid, through the 1115 waiver, uh, and then use our resources to invest in building the system capacity with scale and leverage our results. Thank you. You see, we, we, we've done some good work here that we took to a step forward in combating the opioid epidemic. But if we make it harder for people to enroll in, in Medicaid, such as repealing the Medicaid expansion from the Affordable Care Act, repealing the essential health benefits that mandates mental health coverage by making it difficult for people to enroll like work requirements and actually block granting Medicaid as well, then we're going to take five steps back. And so it's very important to keep that big picture perspective in our efforts. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia for five minutes. Thank, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, let me first answer a question that uh, Mr. McKinley asked of you all, and that was uh, do we, how do we treat this money? And you know, we had the tobacco settlement, and a lot of it in many states went for naught. In Virginia, they created a separate commission that handled the tobacco commission money for economic development purposes. Whatever, whatever purpose your individual states might want, I recommend that model because then you can take that lump sum of money and have it uh, stretch out to assist. In this case, it would be you know, with whatever issues you all had with substance abuse, uh, but that Virginia model has worked well for economic development in the former tobacco producing areas of the Commonwealth. My district is the area stretched between West Virginia and North Carolina down to Kentucky and Tennessee. And while Virginia's numbers look better than West Virginia, my district uh, does not. I have both Martinsville on the North Carolina side that is uh, heavily impacted and then all the areas in coal country in Virginia that are, look very much like West Virginia when it comes to the opioid crisis. Uh, and so I'm very concerned about a lot of these issues and we all are moved by testimony from time to time. And earlier you all had a discussion related to privacy versus integrated medical care. The testimony I remember is the man who came in to testify her, for his brother who could not testify because he had died. He had licked the opioid problem and then was in a major car accident. 
And because the doctors had no idea that he had an opioid problem and because he was unconscious and could not tell anybody, don't give me the opioids, they gave him the opioids. He survived the injuries from the accident. He did not survive the reintroduction of opioids to his system. So we have to work on that problem, and I appreciate all of your testimony in that regard. Foster care. Uh, Mr. Kinsley, you said half of the, the children in uh, foster care, uh, their parents had some form. It was, maybe, it was one of the factors, some form of drug addiction. Uh, but you didn't, I didn't see in your written testimony how many young people that was. <clears throat> um, I can get you the exact numbers. Okay. We have about 12,000 individuals in North right. Carolina in their foster care system. So, so roughly 6,000. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, I thought it was interesting that Dr. Alexander Scott, in your answer to another question, mentioned uh, the school systems and making sure that there was money there. Uh, I know several families that have uh, first gone through foster care and then adopted children who came out of households that were uh, where the parents were, were addicted to various drugs, but particularly uh, opioids, and they have significant behavior problems, and it is taking a lot of efforts. So what, what can we do to help our school systems deal with the next generation? They may not have drug problems themselves, but there's lots of behavior problems. In Rhode Island, we've introduced a student assistance services uh, program that allows for counseling, peer recovery, and support of both the uh, students and their families, and the ability to have that be integrated with what the physical health um, uh, services are for students in school really um, will allow for a, a comprehensive approach to addressing the needs of our youth. Um, and that's in including addition. behavior problems that are, that are a result of being around folks who were using drugs at the time that those those first couple of years is that would that also be included? It does address the the mental health as well as behavioral uh, challenges that youth often face. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And Ms. Smith, uh, I really want to learn more about what Pennsylvania is doing with its drug or excuse me, its doctor. Uh, re loan repayment program oh, yeah. because representing an area that has both significant, as Pennsylvania and West Virginia do, we're all right there in the, in the Appalachian Mountains together. Uh, we need more health care providers out in uh, our most affected areas, uh, the rural areas, particularly the coal counties that have been affected by this. Tell me about that program some more. Sure. So um, this was a, an innovative program that we decided to use some of our federal funding for. So we are a Medicaid expansion state, which means um, for treatment dollar purposes, a lot of our patients are Medicaid patients, which means the federal grant dollars we're getting, we can really use to be innovative and, and think of uh, creative ideas. So we've done some housing things. Um, in this case, we decided how do we address the workforce issue? Because it really is an issue all across the nation. So we decided that you had to be practicing in an area with high opioid use. Um, you had to have at least two years of experience treating patients with substance use disorder. And you had to commit to an additional two years um, in order to, to make good on that loan repayment. Have you had the program long enough to know if the doctors or healthcare providers stay after their two years, their additional two years? Uh, so that? two years has not elapsed okay. since the first. I look forward to getting that information in the future and my time is up, so I'm unfortunate. Yeah, and I'll happy to share some additional information I appreciate about that how many much. we've granted, et cetera. And I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New Hampshire for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I just want to say uh, thank you to you for your leadership. In my seven years in Congress, this is one of the best, most productive hearings I've been at, and it's an honor to be on this committee. I'm the founder and co-chair of the Bipartisan Opioid Task Force that has close to 100 members. Just to give you a sense of the scope, um, New Hampshire, as my colleague, Mr. McKinley, suggested, was hit very hard, along with West Virginia perfect storm situation. Um, but what I'm proud of is that New Hampshire has some very innovative models coming out of the opioid epidemic. And yes, indeed, we need to include methamphetamines and cocaine and the rest. Um, and I wanna focus in on a particularly vulnerable population and a particularly expensive population for the taxpayers, for our communities, and for individuals' personal lives. And that is the incarcerated population, where we know that at least 65% in some of our counties, as high as 85% of the, 
of our incarcerated population have co-occurring mental health and substance use issues. And one of my big aha moments in the last seven years was to discover that something that passed Congress many, many years ago at the, uh, the inception of Medicaid called the Medicaid Inmate Exclusion caused people to lose coverage and lose the funding for healthcare, namely mental health treatment, substance use treatment, during that period of incarceration. New Hampshire is a Medicaid expansion state, thank God, given the discussion today. But literally, the day you go in, you lose your coverage. And to me, if we were to design a system that would fail American taxpayers, families, and communities, it would be this system. Because what happens is people uh, live with very, very high recidivism rates. And we all do. We are the taxpayers. And we have people in incarceration for drug-related crimes getting no treatment for their mental health or substance use disorder. And when they come out, we all act shocked that they go back to their addiction. We're not shocked that they go back to their diabetes. And we shouldn't be shocked that they go back to their addiction. So I have introduced legislation that we call the Humane Correctional Health Care Act. And what this would do is continue Medicaid coverage during incarceration so that we can ensure treatment for substance use disorder and mental illness. And what happens that we've already demonstrated in New Hampshire is a dramatic drop in the recidivism rate from the upwards of 50 to 60% down to 18%. And I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, left, right, or center, that is saving lives and saving taxpayer dollars. And I'm very pleased that Mr. McKinley agreed to join today, as did Dr. Ruiz. Um, so quickly moving on to questions, Dr. Scott, in 2016, I know Rhode Island implemented a statewide treatment program for opioid addiction within your Department of Corrections. I'd love to get the JAMA studies for the record and to share with my colleagues, but can you just explain the overall de decrease in overdose deaths and what the outcome so far of that program has been? Thank you for that question. The key to the program has been making sure that we have all three FDA-approved medications for medication-assisted treatment available to those who are incarcerated. We also allow for screening of all um, incarcerated um, uh, inmates for substance use disorder so that if they weren't previously on an MAT, um, option that was made available to them. And the final key is making sure that prior to release from incarceration, they are connected to one of our community-based behavioral health agencies. They become a client in advance and make sure that once they are released, they are able to have a warm handoff directly to continuing to receive recovery and treatment services at the community level. And that's one of the key components for our programs as well. So as I continue to build bipartisan support for this legislation, I'd love to work with you and others. I know, Ms. Smith, you mentioned housing, um, I, I, or, or maybe that was the, the doctor. Um, but I would like to work on what those supports are to eliminate the barriers to recovery so that people can be successful in their lives, get back to raising their children, get back to work, get back to paying taxes. So thank you, I yield back, and I appreciate this hearing. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, gentlelady from Indiana is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you so much to you and the ranking member for holding this really important hearing. I'm really pleased that we are focusing once again on opioids. Um, it's some of the most important work that I've done in my time here in Congress, and I want to thank each of you and particularly all the states that responded to the committee's questions. Um, it really is wonderful to see all of the progress and all of um, uh, the efforts that, that each of your states are making. 
Um, I think uh, while it's not getting much media attention anymore, I mean, there was a period of time the last few years where opioid issues were on the front pages and on TV all the time. And it's not anymore. It's fallen um, off of the radar, sadly, of the American people, except for those families and those professionals and the people who are dealing with this day in and day out. So I really want to thank you for, um, for your work. I want to focus, go back to the workforce issues, because all of this, whether it's prevention, whether it's treatment, whether it's the work that you all are doing, if we don't have the workforce, um, and I say workforce even beyond um, physicians and uh, addictions, we need to stay focused. My friend across the aisle, Brad Schneider from Illinois and I introduced the Opioid Workforce Act, and it is meant to try to raise the cap on graduate medical education residency slots uh, by a thousand more residencies across the country um, to in, in addiction medicine. Um, I know that I have spoken to IU Med School in Indiana. I represent Indiana, and um, you know IU has, with its grand challenge, tried to put a lot more emphasis on addiction medicine in, in all levels, whether it's in nursing, whether it's in prescribing practices, whether it's in addiction medicine. I want to go back just briefly to start on your loan repayment program and to learn if any other states are doing that. Uh, Ms. Smith, uh, building on what my colleague said, you wanted to say a little bit more about your loan repayment, and then I just want to do like lightning rounds to find out if your states are doing it, and if, if not, why not? Yes. Yeah, so very quickly to add, I was able to, to find the data here in my notes. Um, we made 91 awards to individuals from 23 different counties that totaled $4.7 million for that program. And it was a combination of both mental and behavioral health practitioners, so more of the clinician level. And then um, 1.8 million of it was for actual medical professionals, which includes CRNPs, physicians assistants, and physicians. Excellent. So we tried to really capture the full range of professionals as part of that program. And the second round of awards is, is currently out, so applications uh, are being submitted to us for a second round of awarding for that program. And do you believe if we increased the number of residency slots in addiction medicine, would that be helpful? I do believe it would be helpful. Thank you. Dr. Burrell? Your thank, state. Thank you for this important um, attention to the professional training. In Massachusetts, we were the first state to develop voluntarily with all four of our medical schools um, core competencies that was standardized for all medical students. That was quickly then taken up by all of our three dental schools, as well as our advanced practice nursing programs, physician assistant programs, training over 8,000 individuals in a standardized way so that they could balance the needs of pain management with the potential for opiate misuse. Additionally, our social work schools have taken up that training, as well as physical therapists. So it's enhancing the capacity for individuals to treat this medical illness. I know one of the challenges with med schools is in the past they have given very little time to addiction medicine and, and pain issues. Are they starting at the first year now in your med schools? So the trick with our core competencies is we allowed each individual medical school to create the curriculum the way that they needed to based on what their curriculum is. So they've um, imposed okay. it in multiple different ways, but that allowed, usually curriculum changes take two to three years. This we were able to do in a matter of weeks because the core competencies were broad enough for them to incorporate. And we know from graduating medical students, they're saying that they are seeing the difference and they Excellent. feel more prepared. Thank you. Ms. Mullins. West Virginia. Sure. Uh, we're very excited. We just did a loan repayment program this year. We had over 100 applicants, I think 102. Uh, we funded 22 of those applications in this first round with a two-year requirement to, to practice within the state. That was focused on therapists because so much of West Virginia's existing loan repayment programs focus on the medical, the physician end, so we really wanted something to um, focus on the, ther the therapy level. But in addition to that, we also provided about 154 scholarships, which, in, which with the same types of requirement that eliminated the front end investment and some of the student loan debt as well. Thank you. Mr. Kinsley, very briefly. Uh, we, we have a loan repayment program for both doctors and mid-levels, and we've worked to train over 900 residents in North Carolina, and currently four of our five medical schools have built the training into their core curriculum. 
Thank you. And uh, with the chair's indulgence, if we could get Rhode Island to answer. Absolutely. Ms. I'm Al not leaving Rhode Island. Dr. Alexander Thank Scott. You. Thank you. Our loan repayment program has also expanded to include behavioral health providers. And our medical school uh, does now incorporate the data waiver training into our medical school curriculum so that as students graduate, they automatically have the data waiver to be able to prescribe buprenorphine. Thank you all for working so hard with your higher ed institutions, critically important. It'll make a difference. I yield back. Gentlelady from Florida is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chair DeGette. I want to thank you as well for calling this hearing on the public health epidemic that is the opioid crisis. And thanks to all of you, all of our expert witnesses, who for everything that you're doing to, to help families deal with uh, the dire consequences. Um, in Florida, the past few years, we've lost well over 5,000 of our neighbors per year. And uh, while I'm really proud of the work of this committee passing uh, 21st Century Cures and the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act and the uh, Support Act, there, there is one glaring uh, problem that has been highlighted by a few of my colleagues here today, and that's the, the lack of continuity of care and resources in the minority of states that have not expanded Medicaid. And unfortunately, the state of Florida is one of those. Uh, Mr. Kinsley, North Carolina has not expanded Medicaid. I believe all of the other states have here today, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, West Virginia, Rhode Island. Um, in your written testimony, you noted that, quote, for every single person who is brought to the emergency department, nearly half has no health insurance at all. Further, you stated that expanding Medicaid, quote, would bring an additional $4 billion into North Carolina for health care. All of the uh, Democratic members of the Florida congressional delegation yesterday sent a letter back home. Uh, it's the opening day of, our, of the Florida legislature. And um, our, our message to the governor and to uh, members back in Florida was that uh, you're not doing right by our citizens. One recent study said if Florida expanded Medicaid, we would draw down almost $14 billion for our state over the next five years alone. It would improve people's health, it would improve people's access to health, health care, um, and it would do so much for, for families who suffer uh, the consequences of the substance use disorder. Mr. Kinsley, can Kinsley, talk, talk to us again about how expanding Medicaid in North Carolina uh, would allow the state to better target the use of federal grant dollars to address uh, the opioid epidemic. Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Um, at present, more than two-thirds of the federal state opioid response and state target response grants that North Carolina receives is just going for treatment for expanding care for the individuals that are uninsured. And that is a laudable and notable purpose for those dollars, but we do not have those dollars available to building our workforce, to training our individuals, to increasing the way that our system works together and coordinates care. Instead, we are expanding treatment because we do not have Medicaid expansion in North Carolina. The North Carolina State Legislature reopened and reconvened today around a budget that has not been able to be passed, primarily in the debate of Medicaid expansion in North Carolina. And I, too, hope that we are able to expand and increase access in North Carolina. Other recent studies have shown that now 37 states plus the District of Columbia have expanded. The other states that haven't, uh, we're sending our, our dollars to and subsidizing the budgets and health care of citizens of other states. Congresswoman Custer wants to take me to lunch uh, for this or something. Um, Ms. Smith, how, ha how many lives have you saved in Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania expanded Medicaid? So in Pennsylvania, as a result of Medicaid expansion, we've been able to treat about 125,000 uh, additional patients. So for us, that, that's huge. Um, I can tell you with the large amount of funding, over $230 million coming to the state, if we did not have Medicaid expansion, you would not be hearing me talking about a loan repayment program, about housing, about expanding MAT and corrections, about any of those things. Um, because the reality is that we would be spending all of those dollars just on, I'll call it plain old treatment. Um, so as a result of Medicaid expansion, we've been able to repurpose those dollars in ways that allow us to modernize the system, to integrate with physical health, 
mental health, behavioral health all together in one system moving forward. Um, so I, I really can't stress enough the importance of having participated in Medicaid expansion and certainly hope that it and continues Dr. for years to come. Uh, Burrell, how about you in Massachusetts? In Massachusetts, the foundation of our treatment is having access to the medical treatment that is proven and evidence-based. Because we have that, we have been able to tackle the very challenging and complex issues related to getting individuals to that care, preventing disease in the first place, making sure that individuals who are at highest risk not only obtain that cane, but stay in that with recovery coaching, which is, by the way, covered by our Medicaid 1115 waiver now. And Ms. And thank you. And Ms. Yes. Mullins, West Virginia, I believe, has the highest share of population served um, through Medicaid. Uh, and you talked about the importance of predictability. How important has Medicaid expansion been to opioid uh, and substance use treatment? Um, you talked about the predictability of care and the predictability of those resources. It's very important in terms of sustaining. We, I talked about the infrastructure that we've been building without Medicaid paying for residential treatment. There is no way to sustain those valuable services. And according to my notes, we have over 21,000 West Virginians receiving medication-assisted treatment in our state. Thank you very much. Thank, I you. Be back. Thank you so much. Uh, gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks to the um, panel of witnesses. Very compelling testimony today, and I thank you all for coming. Um, we, we've learned, of course, that uh, one of the root causes um, is inappropriate prescribing practices, and uh, a number of you have spoken uh, to that today. And we know that many states, such as Virginia and Maine and Rhode Island, have set prescribing limits for opioids. Dr. Alexander Scott, you highlighted that as part of the response to addiction crisis, your state enacted regulations in 2017 that limited the initial prescription of an opioid for a new patient to no more than 30 what are called morphine milligram equivalents, or MMEs, per day. Could you describe um, a little bit more for us the danger to some patients of exceeding that limit? And do you think that the policy's been successful in steering providers to make better prescribing decisions for their patients? Thank you, Congressman. We had data that said the higher the morphine milligram equivalents um, a patient is on for the longer period of time, the higher their risk is of becoming um, addicted to opioids over time, and thus their risk of an overdose. Um, we wanted to make sure that there was flexibility for the provider in um, determining what was needed for the patient, and we also thought it critical to distinguish between acute pain and chronic pain in limiting the opioids prescribed. So by um, uh, cutting off the MME at uh, 30 uh, for an uh, acute uh, reason for pain, um, we have seen a um, substantial decrease in the number of opioids prescribed for an initial um, uh, use of uh, pain, particularly for acute pain scenarios. We have chosen to handle chronic pain needs separately because oftentimes people already have an addiction or a tolerance to opioids that require uh, a more multidisciplinary approach to addressing that. Let me, let me drill down on that a little bit more um, because I know the CDC in their recommendations has um, indicated that providers should avoid prescribing over 90 MMEs a day, and many states have put that kind of recommendation into code. I think Nevada and South Carolina have limited opioid prescriptions to 90 MMEs or under in most patient cases. There are a lot of products on the market, um, especially extended release and long-acting opioid products that do exceed that even 90 um, MME a day limit, and some of them even double or triple that limit. So I understand that the products are intended for patients who've become opioid resistant, as you mentioned, to these lower dose products. But do these high dosage opioids pose enough of an overdose risk that we should at least begin to explore methods to limit their market availability in your judgment? 
We have certainly considered that in our regulations approach for acute pain management. In addition to the 30 morphine milligram equivalents uh, limitation, we have also required that long-acting opioids are not used for acute pain in those scenarios as well because of the uh, challenge that can occur. And again, distinguishing from those patients that already are dealing with chronic pain and would need to be handled separately. Well, thank you. I know um, FDA has taken previous action to limit the use of these high-dose products, and they've imposed something called a REMS, a Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy Program on providers who prescribe these products. Um, I also know that there was a recently released um, uh, JAMA study on um, this topic that failed to find any evidence that the REMS program was actually successful at achieving those goals of reducing inappropriate prescribing. Given the CDC um, recommendations, state precedent on prescribing limits, the lack of existing action, it may be time for FDA um, or Congress or both of us to explore options for limiting the market availability of high-dose opioid products that are currently on the market and limiting these new high-dose products, uh, restraining them from entering the market in the future. So I think that's something we want to look at, and I look forward to exploring a wide array of solutions to combating the opioid crisis and making sure states have the funding and flexibility to support these affected communities. And thank you again for your testimony. I yield back. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our panel for an interesting and very helpful uh, conversation. In your testimony, many of you hit on a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and that is eliminating bureaucratic and unnecessary barriers to substance use treatment. Uh, research has shown that individuals who are being actively treated with buprenorphine lower their risk of opioid overdose by up to 50 percent, even when provided without corresponding comprehensive psychosocial supports or services. With any other medication that lowered mortality by 50 percent, we would be rightfully hailing this as a miracle drug and doing everything in our power to get it out, of, out to anyone who could possibly need it. Unfortunately, here in the United States, we continue to make it harder to obtain these medications than the powerful opioids that got us into uh, the problem in the first place. So, Secretary Smith, I was pleased to see that in your testimony, you called for the elimination of the requirement for providers to obtain a waiver from the DEA in order to prescribe buprenorphine for uh, treating opioid dependence. I have introduced the Bipartisan Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act with over 100 co-sponsors to do exactly that. Can you describe for the committee why this is such an important step to take in, uh, in expanding access to addiction treatment? Absolutely, and thank you so much for sponsoring that legislation that, that we are fully supportive of. So I, I mentioned earlier in my opening that we've expanded our DEA X waivered physicians to over 4,000. Um, and we are near the top of the list when you look at states in terms of number of X waivered physicians, but looks can be deceiving. So when you actually take a look at those 4,000 waivered doctors and you look at what are their prescribing capacities and then whether or not they're actually prescribing up to their capacity or not, uh, it's pretty staggering. So we've got a, a very large percentage who are still at that um, 30 patient capacity level, and most of them are not even prescribing up to 30 patients. And so we've worked with uh, an organization called Vital Strategies to design a survey that's going to go out to all 4,000 of our ex waivered physicians in the state to ask some very specific questions about why they aren't treating more patients. Would they be willing to treat more patients? Is it an education? issue? Um, is it a, a barrier because of additional oversight? And so anecdotally, we've definitely heard that efforts to over-regulate is what they often say. Um, doctors who were trained to administer any and all kinds of medication, but to specifically call out this kind of medication and say you need a, a special waiver to administer this, um, they just don't want to be bothered with that. And so Pennsylvania believes that any steps we can take to eliminate those barriers to change the conversation around the idea that treating addiction is a, a clinical necessity and we rely on trained physicians to be able to provide that treatment. 
If I could have the rest of the panel respond yes or no, do you agree with the assessment just made by Secretary Smith? Um, Yes. yes, hello. Um, thank you for that question. Um, the yep. access to MAT and decreasing the barriers is critical, and we also spoke about it in our um, testimony. And so you, do you agree with the waiver? Yes. Yeah, I, I want to use my time here wisely, so thank you. Yes, and um, Ms. Williams? Mullins, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, yes, but we, we don't have the therapists to really support those physicians once they are... Uh, can prescribe. For us, the workforce shortage is way more impacted on the therapy and the counseling side. Mr. Kinsley, please. Yes, we're supportive. And doctor? Yes, we support and also look to e expand the, um, the, the services available as well. Okay, and many of you also mentioned individuals released from incarceration as a population particularly vulnerable to opioid overdose, with Commissioner Burrell noting that the justice-involved population has a death rate of 120 times higher than the general population. Uh, I heard your exchange with uh, my colleague from New Hampshire. So while federal grant opportunities such as the Medication Assisted Treatment Reentry Initiative are helping to fill in some of the gaps, I believe a more comprehensive and sustainable strategy is required. Therefore, I've championed the Medicaid Reentry Act, which would allow states to restart Medicaid benefits for incarcerated individuals 30 days prior to release, providing a sustainable funding stream for medication-assisted treatment, case management, and recovery support services, and creating a more seamless transition back into community care. Um, Dr. Or Commissioner Burrell, would allowing states the flexibility to restart Medicaid benefits for eligible incarcerated individuals 30 days prior to release, help to reduce overdose deaths uh, for that population? Making sure there's a continuity of care is critical, both the medical and the other support mechanisms that you stated. Thank you. Um, I've exhausted my time. I have several other questions which I'll submit to the subcommittee, and with that, uh, I yield. Back. I thank the gentleman. Gentlelady from New York is recognized now for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I think our ranking member, we've heard a lot of encouraging story, stories from the states today about how they would be able to put federal funds to use and make progress. But it's also clear that there are still unmet needs and unresolved challenges that states face as they work to address the ongoing crisis. I'd like to explore some of the remaining challenges as we consider further support. Um, Ms. Mullins, in your testimony, you noted unresolved challenges around building a robust addiction treatment workforce, including attracting and retaining people to work in rural areas throughout the state. Can you describe what steps the state has undertaken to address this challenge and what additional hurdles remain? So there's multiple challenges for this. It is a pervasive workforce shortage in all areas of employment in West Virginia. We do not have enough people to, feel, to fill our vacancies. But it also is about parity in terms of what we pay our mental health and addictions workforce. It is not the same. So when students graduate with debt, it is they're graduating with levels of debt, but it cannot really expect to earn salaries that are commensurate with their levels of education. So to me, that, that that is a fundamental thing that we must address in, and the student loan debt to go with it. So we've really been focusing on those loan repayment programs, scholarship programs, anything that we can to really um, increase, A, our pipeline, mm -hmm. but then also to provide the ongoing education that we can. And we're finding that our individuals that are entering recovery have a really strong interest in providing services. So we're paying particular attention in our loan repayment programs, even to persons who might be in recovery and wishing to take those next steps to enter the workforce so in that, that way. So is that at the state level? Is there something at the federal level that you think can be helpful in sort of undergirding and helping to uh, unearth individuals who, who would move into that line of work. I think that the flexibility to use the funds in, in those creative ways would, would really be very beneficial. Very well. Secretary Smith, in your written testimony submitted to the committee, you also referenced the lack of additional treatment, excuse me, addiction retreatment workforce, and noted that, quote, demands 
on addiction treatment workforce will increase as more people move toward treatment and recovering, end quote. So can you describe how the lack of addiction treatment workforce has inhibited Pennsylvania's ability to provide services to vulnerable populations? And what steps have your state taken to address this problem, given that more people are moving toward treatment and recovery? Yeah, certainly. Um, our workforce challenges, um, particularly in urban centers like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, uh, have really inhibited the ability for some of those more vulnerable populations to access treatment. Um, to give you an example, we have a, um, an advisory council that advises my department, and one of the members of that council uh, is a practicing addiction medicine physician who happens to also treat adolescents um, but he is part of the Latino community. And his practice is so overwhelmed with patients um, that he's working well into the night beyond his office closure hours because those individuals have nowhere else to go. Um, and so part of the challenges that we hear in building a workforce where you don't have communication barriers, so where you've got doctors who are treating patients that really understand them and communicate with them, a lot of the challenges come down to the education and training requirements um, and some of those language barriers that exists in being able to meet those requirements. So you've ID'd uh, cultural competence, essentially. Yes. Very well. Um, Mr. Kinsley, in North Carolina's response letter to the committee, the state notes that, quote, in many of North Carolina's communities hardest hit by the opioid epidemic, it is difficult to implement programs and build treatment and recovery access because the community lacks basic infrastructure, including broadband and cell phone service, end quote. So uh, can you describe how broadband and cell phone services are important to helping North Carolina address the opioid epidemic in these communities? And what more could Congress do to overcome this challenge? Thank you for the question. Um, telehealth access in our rural communities is a key strategy for our efforts to expand access to treatment, yet there are many parts of North Carolina that can't sustain more than a 4G signal digitally or have access to broadband. Um, and so without those, we're not able to sustain those services. That, of course, is built on the fact that, you know, it, it's a sustainable approach for education, for all of these providers, for parity. I agree with what all of my colleagues have said. Have said. Very well. I've run out of time. And Dr. Scott, I did have a question for you, but I'll submit it uh, for your uh, response at a later time. But Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, ask for uh, this letter from New York State, the Office of Addiction Services and Support, to be uh, added to the record. Objection. Thank you. It's, it's entered. Okay, thank you. I yield back, Madam Chair. Our Chair now recognizes the very patient Mr. Latta for five minutes, and welcome to the subcommittee. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and first, uh, I want to thank you very much for letting me wave on today. I greatly appreciate it, because this is a really important and very relevant topic. Uh, just in the, one of the major newspapers in the state of Ohio yesterday had an article that just came out, and something we'd heard coming. But we know that in 2009, we had 1,423 1, people die of overdoses in the state of Ohio. That number went up in 2017 to 4,854. And, you know, we, we, the, the trend right now, thank heavens, it's going down. It was 3,764 last year. But these are all deaths that we don't want to see at all, these overdose deaths. And I know when I've gone around my district, it's, it's very important because when I'm talking to my health care providers and other folks out there, one of the things they were telling me for several years is we can't find help. And so it was everything from finding the dollars to finding uh, where they can get services. And so in the last Congress, I introduced the, what we call the Info Act, that would establish a dashboard through HHS so the states and communities could go out there and find help. And what I'd like to ask you all today is just some questions as to what's uh, going on in your states, if I may. And uh, if I could ask everyone, it's, I don't have a lot of time, but if you maybe be brief on your answers. But some of your states have developed public-facing dashboards. When were these dashboards created, and what information do you have in them? If we just go right down the line. Sure, I'll be as brief as possible. Pennsylvania does have an interactive opioid data dashboard. If you go to pa.gov slash opioids, you're able to access that. It contains information like um, prescription drug monitoring information, overdose deaths, naloxone distributions, NAS, EMS leave behinds, um, treatment statistics, and the number goes on and on and on. Um, so happy for you to check that out, and if you have questions, 
let me know. Um, and was there a second part to your question? Well, it was just main, main, oh, when? You know, what information do you have contained in them? Yeah, and it was established about two years ago. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you for the question. Since 2015, Massachusetts has put out a quarterly dashboard that contains much of the same information related to a number of deaths, both reported and predictable, using a predictive model, as well as town by city. So all 351 towns and cities get a report on the number of deaths um, in their community, so they can do local-based planning as well, as well as EMS and healthcare data. We also, since 2015, have put together for the first time data across state government. So we're looking for the first time at health data as it relates to public health, but also criminal justice, schools, et cetera. Thank you. So for West Virginia, over the last couple of years, uh, we've been using um, reports uploaded quarterly uh, that highlight things like overdose deaths, uh, prescription drug monitoring, and different data points that we've been focusing on through our grants with the Centers for Disease Control and Surveillance. We've done that, we do that quarterly, but this week actually we expect to um, upload and make public uh, a, a dashboard that tracks non-fatal deaths, non-fatal overdoses, and um, stay tuned. We're really looking forward to releasing that this week. Thank you. North Carolina launched, launched its opioid action plan dashboard in 2017. This dashboard not only has uh, key data points and is updated consistently around the opioid epidemic, but it also broadens into other aspects of substance use disorder. It allows counties and local communities to drill down into the information in their community, which we have see, seen as being incredibly powerful at aligning all of us to the same strategies and also getting foundations, non-governmental entities, private-public partnerships on board with focusing their dollars in the same way that we need to focus. And the other thing is that all of these indicators relate back to our, our strategies as key performance indicators that help us measure our success in this effort. Similar to what's been heard in Rhode Island, when the governor uh, activated the Overdose Prevention and Intervention Task Force, we understood that having a dashboard um, would be critical to that, um, and that was activated in the 2015 uh, timeframe. Our dashboard does serve as a uh, uh, metric for each of our strategic initiatives on prevention, recovery, reversal, and um, uh, treatment, and also allows for the public to be able to access where treatment services are, naloxone is available, as well as um, access to other recovery services that are needed. Thank you. In my last 15 seconds, if I could do this real quick, uh, if I could just ask real quick, maybe if it's a yes or no, have, you, have your communities had a, a problem finding those federal dollars out there to get that help? I mean, just yes or no down the line? Yes and no. Okay. Um, mostly no because of the way our procurement system has worked and the uh, capacity to put data out into the community so they know what problems they're seeing and they can then ask us for the appropriate funding that's Thank targeted. You. Um, I would go with um, Deputy Secretary, well, Secretary Smith's answer, yes and no. Um, many people have no trouble, but there are still some folks out there struggling to find, find that information. Okay, thank you. We've been able to deploy funds to more than 50 local communities. Our issue is primarily that we don't have enough funds because they're all going to augment treatment. We use a data-driven process to target which communities need it most and are really looking, given that it's Rhode Island, to make sure that every town and uh, city uh, has access to the services needed. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Again, I want to thank you very much for allowing me to wave on today. Thank, thank, I thank the gentleman. Um, and I want to thank all of our witnesses. Uh, I, one of the members said this was one of the best hearings we've had uh, this session, and I agree. It's really excellent and very good information as we move forward to see what our next steps are. Um, in response to the committee's September 18th letter, the committee received responses from 16 states regarding how the states address the opioid crisis with the support of federal funding. And I move to enter all of those responses into the record. And in addition, um, uh, let's see, we're gonna enter them all from Florida, Indiana, Kentucky, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Tennessee, West Virginia and Wisconsin, without objection, those will be ordered. And in addition, um, in, in continuation of our bipartisan work looking at addiction and treatment issues today, the committee is sending a bipartisan letter um, signed by the ranking member, myself, and others, 
um, letters to the DEA, DHS, and HHS about the emergence of what this panel was talking about, um, methamphetamine and, and polysubstance use, and what the administration is doing about this. And I would ask unanimous consent to enter those three letters into the record. Without objection, that will be ordered as well. And I, the Chair would like to remind members that pursuant to the committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witnesses. Several of the members did ask the witnesses uh, to answer additional questions, and I would ask all of you to respond promptly if you receive any of those questions. And with that, this subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you.